In this example, we're looking at a heat pump cycle. We're told that we uh, require a heat transfer rate of 3 million BTUs per hour at 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the heat transfer rate up here uh, into the hot reservoir. Uh, recall that this, this region is the hot reservoir up here. And the purpose of a heat pump is to move energy into the hot reservoir. It's proposed that a refrigerant 134A uh, vapor compression heat pump be used to develop the process heating using wastewater stream at 125 degrees Fahrenheit as the low temperature source. So that's the cold reservoir down here. So that's the cold reservoir. We're told the compressor, compressor isentropic efficiency is 80%. So that's the compressor efficiency here. Sketch the TS diagram for the cycle and determine the specific enthalpy at the compressor exit. So that's state two. So that we're trying to find that specific enthalpy. Uh, the temperatures at each of the principal states in degrees Fahrenheit. So states one through four, we want to find the temperatures. The mass flow rate of the refrigerants in pounds mass per hour. So through the whole cycle. Compressor power going into uh, the compressor right here. Let me just put down W dot N. So we need to find that. And then the coefficient of performance uh, for the whole cycle and compare that with the coefficient of performance for a Carnot heat pump cycle operating between reservoirs at the process temperature and wastewater temperature respectively. So we want to compare it to a Carnot cycle operating between those two reservoirs. All right, so let's get started. Uh, for part A, to find the specific enthalpy at the compressor exit in BTUs per pound mass. So we're told, <clears throat> excuse me, we're told the compressor isentropic efficiency is 80%. So what we'll do is make use of that information um, along with the first law. So what we're going to do is draw a little control volume around the compressor. And let's go ahead and write the comp compressor isentropic efficiency. So if you go back and take a look at the notes, so this will be, if you look back at the notes, that's defined as the power you have to put into the compressor under isentropic conditions divided by the power actual. And when you do the first law analysis around that compressor, what you'll find is in the numerator, comes out to be H2S minus H1, and the denominator will be H2 minus H1. It's the same mass flow rate, whether it's uh, the isentropic case or the actual case, so the mass flow rates drop out. So you can then rearrange that equation to solve for H2. Oops, uh, this will be H2 is equal to H1 plus H2S minus H1 all over the compressor isentropic efficiency. And if you look at that, we do know already H1, that's given up in the table. We know the isentropic efficiency, that's given in the problem statement right up, uh, right up here, 80%. So what we don't know is H2S. In order to find that, we'll make use of the fact that it's an isentropic process uh, for state 2S going from 1 to 2. So we know that P2S is equal to P2, which is from the table 100, uh, 400 PSIA. And we know S2S is equal to S1, which we can find from the thermodynamic property tables. This is refrigerant 134A. So if you look in the property tables For state one, so P1 is for 180 PSIA, and H1 is 116.74 BTUs per pound mass. If you look through property tables for that, you can find that you'll find that um, this is a saturated vapor state. And by the way, the tables I used were from the back of your textbook, the Moran and Shapiro textbook. So it was a saturated vapor state. The corresponding temperature was 117.74 degrees Fahrenheit. That's one of the pieces of information we're asked to find in the problem. And S1 is 0.2154 BTUs per pound mass 
degrees ranking. So using the property tables, we can find that. So S2S will have the same specific entropy. We can then go back to the property tables for that state and look up the other conditions corresponding to that, the other properties corresponding to those two properties. And you have to do a little bit of interpolation, but what you'll find is T2S comes out to be 186 degrees Fahrenheit uh, under those conditions. And H2S is 123.32 BTUs per pound mass. And now that we know H2S, we can go back to our expression that we derived up here to find H2. So when you plug in those numbers, H2 comes out to be 124.97 BTUs per pound mass. And that, going back to the tables, so now, if, now that we know H2 and we know the pressure at 2, we can find the corresponding uh, temperature at state 2. So let me just write down P2 here is 400 PSIA. And going to the property tables, you'll find that T2 comes out to be 191.63 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so uh, what we've done so far is part A of this problem, find the specific enthalpy at the compressor exit, state 2. So we, we did that right here. So I'll, let me box in that answer just so it's highlighted. Uh, part B is find the temperatures at each of the, find the temperatures at each of the principal states in degrees Fahrenheit. We've done so far state one. Uh, did we, yeah, we did state one and we've done state two. Now we need to do the other states. These are simple lookups in the, well, I shouldn't say simple, but these are just lookups in the property tables for uh, R134A. So we can look those up. I'll just make a note of them here. So T3 comes out to be 179.95 degrees Fahrenheit, and T4 comes out to be 117.74 degrees Fahrenheit. And this uh, T3 is a saturated liquid state, and T4 is a saturated vapor state. All right, so now we've finished that part of the problem temperatures at each of the principal states. Now part C is find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant in pounds mass per hour. So the way we can find that is to look at the condenser and do the first law analysis on that condenser. Let me draw a control volume around it. And the reason I say the condenser is because if you look in the problem statement, we know what the required heat transfer rate is. It's uh, about three, well, we're told it's three million BTUs per hour. So we know what the Q dot is there. We know the specific enthalpies at the inlet and the outlet, so we should be able to find the mass flow rate. So when we do the first law on the condenser, we'll get Q dot removed. So this means removed from the cycle. It's M dot H2 minus H3. And then when you uh, solve for the mass flow rate from that, it'll come out to be 6.13 times 10 to the fourth pounds mass per hour. Uh, the, there's some unit conversions that have to be done here because we're dealing with these uh, terrible English units, but uh, that's just, just the way it is. Okay. Going back to the problem statement, we're now asked to find the compressor power in BTUs per hour. That can be found by again going back to the first law analysis for the compressor. We now know H2 and H1, so we should be able to find the compressor power from that. So first law to the compressor, you'll find that the power going in to the compressor is M dot times H2 minus H1, and when you plug in the numbers it's 5.05 .05 times 10 to the fifth BTUs per hour. It would probably be better to convert that into um, horsepower, but I, I, since that's a more conventional unit, but I, I didn't do it that way. 
All right. Let's see. The next thing is to find the coefficient of performance for this heat pump cycle and then compare it to the coefficient of performance for a Carno cycle, a Carno heat pump between the same reservoir temperature. So let's do the coefficient of performance. So the coefficient of performance for this heat pump is what, what we care about is the heat removed from the cycle. We want to get as much of that as possible for as little power that we have to put into it. So it's going to be Q dot removed over W dot in. Q dot removed over W dot in. So we know the values for that. We, we calculated those a little bit um, just, just right here. Here's um, Well, we're given Q, Q dot removed, right? So Q dot removed is the 3 million BTUs per hour. And the power in is the um, 5. Uh, about 500,000 BTUs per hour. So when you plug in those numbers, let me just write them here just so you have have at least the Q dot removed available. When you work those numbers out, it comes out to be 5.95 for the coefficient of performance. So that's the the coefficient of performance for this for the actual cycle that we have here. Now for the Carnot cycle, the, to find that, what we need to keep in mind is that the Carnot cycle is a reversible cycle, and it'll be the maximum, the maximum coefficient of performance that you can possibly get. And it only depends on the temperatures of the hot and cold reservoirs. Okay, so the maximum COP that we would get, corresponding to a Carnot cycle, which again is a reversible cycle, it's the maximum COP you'll ever get. It'll be the temperature of the hot reservoir divided by TH minus TC, where those are absolute temperatures. So um, for the hot reservoir, that temperature was 170, oops, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that you need to convert these to um, you need to com convert these to Rankine so that you add in 459 to get it to degrees Rankine. So then on the bottom, it's 170 plus 459 minus the cold reservoir temperature, which was 125 degrees plus 459. And so when you solve that, that comes out to be a value of 14. So you can see our actual coefficient of performance is quite a bit lower than the, the, the best coefficient of performance you can possibly get. So what that means is that there's some room for improvement uh, for making this cycle more thermodynamically efficient. The very last thing was to plot all of this on a TS diagram. So we have our axes. We'll draw the vapor dome because we're dealing with we're dealing with a um, uh, R134A which changes phase. So let me draw in uh, some isobars. So leading in to the so leading into the compressor right here, state one, will um, you have to look up the conditions for that. So we, we had those conditions and I believe I wrote down somewhere here, yeah, that that was a saturated vapor. So we'll put that point right here. Oops, mark it on here. So there's our state one. So this would be our isobar for state one. And then going into state two, this is downstream of the compressor. We have another isobar because the pressure will increase. And if you, I didn't mention this before, but if you look up the properties corresponding to state two here, that turns out to be superheated vapor. So state two is over in the superheated vapor regime. And it's over here because it's, um, compressor has some isentropic efficiency that's less than 100%. So there's 0.2. Here's 0.2s right there. So that's in the superheated vapor regime. State 3, I had mentioned uh, earlier that that turns out to be a saturated liquid. State 4 is a saturated vapor. So let's make a note of these. Something's not right about state 4. I'm going to have to come back to that for a moment. I'm going to cross this out for state 4. I apologize for that. State three, though, is a saturated liquid. So there's my state three. So what we do is we go from state two 
along the isobar over to state three. That's a saturated liquid. State four going through the expansion valve, that'll be a saturated liquid vapor mixture. So that should look something like this. And then from state four to state one, that's along the isobar. So I'll just make a note here. P1 is equal to P4, P2 is equal to P3. So that's what our path looks like for this particular case. And you can see the temperatures are all a little different. So that would be T2, T2S would be a little bit less. T3 would, oops, that's T2S. T3 would be less still, and T4 and T1 are the same. And you could do the same sort of thing for the specific entropies. S3 would be our lowest specific entropy. S4 is a little bit larger because going through that, going through that um, throttling valve is inherently non-isentropic. And then going from state one to state two, the entropy increases as well because the um, we're told that the compressor has a, a an isentropic efficiency of 80%, meaning the entropy is going to increase somewhat. So I apologize that I, um, I made a little mistake. I'm going to mention up here this should be a separate saturated liquid vapor mixture if you look at the table for state four. So, All right, I believe I've covered everything that is required on this problem. Hopefully it all seems um, like review for you. Um, I know the units are kind of a pain to work with, but at least the concept, the steps involved for solving the problem hopefully seem um, straightforward and something of a review. Perhaps the only thing here that might have tripped you up a little bit is finding the coefficient of performance for a Carnot heat pump cycle. You just have to remember that this is the ideal best you're ever going to get uh, performance, which just means it depends only on the reservoir temperatures. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.